Okay, good morning. It is now March 2nd, week nine. This is MED 110, 5DAX. Um, so it is uh, Tuesday morning at nine ish, and we're going to start. And uh, today we're going to do Senora Piggy. Hi, what's up? Okay, the first thing that we're going to do, and we have the lovely Miss Brittany here, so she will be cutting. And I'll be her assistant before, until uh, we get uh, some other personnel here, which I hope. So the first thing that we're gonna do, and I was mentioning, good morning, sir. How are you doing? Do you see our, do you see our video? All right, kindly put on mute and we are doing the dissection today. So the first thing we're going to do, as you saw in, uh, we have a little booklet here, is the beauty of uh, doing uh, pig dissection is because the fetal pig looks a lot, there's a lot of things in here that are very, very similar to a human being. Now, we can't afford a, a, a real human being like a, a cadaver, right? And it's also big. What am I, where am I going to store that thing? Right here, you got a little Miss Piggy, right? We could put it here, and these are fetal pigs. Morning, morning, you know the protocol. Uh, we just barely started. So what we're gonna do here, and this is just like what we do with vivisection in pathology, if we're gonna do an autopsy on a human being. So we lie them out like this, and Ms. Brittany will be doing, you're gonna be cutting right here, straight down. This is the umbilical cord or the umbilicus, right? And then around the umbilical, then all the way down to the anus. And that is our first cut. Now, uh, if you look at the way she's holding the, uh, the scalpel, right? That was one way, uh, uh, the way she's holding it and she's using her second digit as kind of like a guide. So it's like pointing. The other way is to hold it like a pen. All right, so I'll be the assistant. So Ms. Brittany, first cut please. Ah, okay, you're fine, all right? Okay, now. Okay, don't be shy. Now, she's cutting just deep. You don't have to be too hard, right? Cutting just deep enough, right? Okay, now go around, watch your thumb. Let me hold this part. Okay, all the way down. Oh, wish we had, uh, wish we had a nurse. So, okay, wonderful. Okay, now, before we move further, yeah, let's get this closer. If you could see here, there's different layers and you can see the insides well because there's a lot of uh, moistness, but uh, you could see how it's, uh, if you were here, it's slippery, right? So remember this, our skin, innate immunity, and then we have that mucosal lining. So Ms. Brittany, feel it. Isn't it like, what does it feel like to you? Yeah. And you feel that, that it doesn't, it's not water, right? That's what water doesn't feel like this, right? It feels slippery, right? And that's mucus. And those two things, which are, looks like a beautiful, since next week is our um, final written, which by the way, will be online, right? Um, those are our two innate defenses. And it will trap uh, a foreign body, uh, bacteria, because, and that's why I'm not a proponent of surgery because when you open up, I'm already now exposing you to way too many stuff. And that's the reason why we give you prophylactic um, antibiotics uh, 12 to 24 hours prior to the surgery. And right, even though there's no signs in, of infection, what do I do right after the surgery? I give you more antibiotics because now I know why. I now violated your mucosal lining and now I also violated what? The skin. Now let's look at the skin. If you look at the outer layer, Miss Brittany, grab that. See if you can rip that with your hands. Can you rip it? It's, it's hard, isn't it? But the inside, see this inside? I can easily rip that. See how thin it is? So remember the layers of the skin. And, let's, and here's a nice trick. See how I can separate it? And then there's, well, there's not much fat on here, but you could see the epidermal layer 
how tough it is. So remember what I mentioned in lecture, everything on the outside is what? Is a lot tougher than everything on the inside and it makes sense. So uh, skin is a bre living, breathing thing. Now you might not be able to see in the video, but here, for those of us who are here in lab, can you guys see here? Like on the, it goes on the inner, inner layers, there's little, ar there's little arteries and veins you guys can see. See that, see that? Now, if you see an artery and vein <coughs> that looks like a, like a, a whitish yellowish hair, that's a nerve. So wherever there's an artery and a vein, there's gotta be what? There's gotta be a nerve floating around somewhere, right? Because we have to have not only an artery that takes oxygenated blood to where it needs to go, a vein that has to take the deoxygenated blood or the carbon dioxide away so we can, you know, piggy can breathe it out, right? Also, I need the nerve for as a communication system. So right now, and then, uh, so those are the, just right off the bat, that's what we're looking at regarding skin. Now, I have to ask our surgeon now to cut here. I'm, I'm, now you can assist. Now you cut all the way, like up to here, like, uh, uh, like from here. And then here like this, just uh, as the textbook, and I'll open it up, not the textbook, our little dissection. I'll open it up to that section. So your job, you can sit here, you can hold it. Now, your job is to make sure to cut the pig and not hurt, okay? okay. So communicate with each other. And let me uh, open up uh, that. I have a little right here. <laughs> Let me open it up to that section. So, ladies, see how you okay. open it up here and then you can open up underneath the jaw, just okay. like that. Okay. Now, since there's three of you, right? You guys are gonna rotate. And I, and for, for those of you looking for a medium glove, are you wanna, this morning, I'm gonna try. Because the next thing now we're going to expose, we already now talked about the skin, the layer, there's layers, and then there's a mucosal layer, and then there's a skin, an inside skin, and we're going to show that in a moment, and that's our fascia. And then uh, what we're doing now is opening up a limb, or several limbs, so that we can open it up and cut it up so we can now see muscular tissue and its relationship to the bone via the tendon. So how the muscles come together, you know, just like a chicken bone. Okay. I really should get a webcam and shouldn't make my life easier. You want me to have a head? There you go. It's a little higher. Yeah, right underneath the chin, you know, around there, and then, you know, just like the Joker, all the way down, because we're, because after you guys switch, then you'll be the surgeon for this upper part, and then you will be the, uh, the assistant, and then, and the uh, round robin after. You can you can cut more. You can exaggerate all the way down like to his ears or to her ears. Yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> okay. So now let's switch. You'll be the surgeon, and you can be the uh, uh, the person here holding it, All right? And you see how this works? We're gonna uh, every time we, so so everyone's gonna get to cut whether you like it or not, and get to look at stuff. So your job is to make sure the uh, the pig is stable, right? And to keep your fingers or your phalanges out of the way. So now, the next thing I want you to do, and you could use these uh, these straight scissors 
is to open this up kind of like that, mm -hmm. right? And your job is to hold this so that we can properly visualize it. And you can put your other hand right down like that, right? Now, <laughs> dangerous, right? So use this one, right? The, the one closest to you. So press this one? So open this up, just like the way we open this up. Make an incision here, incision here, incision here, like a big H. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to open it up so we can now start looking at uh, muscles and tendons. Okay. Now here's a trick. It's really, mm -hmm. I drank ginger ale. Now I'm very gassy. Now, if you could see this, might not be able to see that at home, but well, those of us here, do we see that extra skin? Mm -hmm. And then again, everyone touch it, feel it, feel the outside, and then feel the inside. The inside is like, is like uh, a slimy, right? And it's that's the mucosal lining. And if we all see, the skin on the outside, just like, you know, when you eat chicken, there's skin on the outside, but there's also skin or a covering on the inside. So this inside covering here that's covering the muscles, that's called fascia. So if I damage my muscles or damage my bone, don't you think I could also damage my fascia, the covering, right? If I broke my bone or if I, I messed everything up in here, right? So I also have to do a, uh, a fasciaplasty. Remember, plasty meaning to repair. Or if I have to open it up because it, uh, there's pressure or there's blood or whatever, because I have to do a fasciotomy. I got to cut in there and open it all up. Because when you get damaged here, like a really bad uh, compound fracture, it'll, you can see how there, it's in compartments, right? Does everyone see how like, this is a room, this is a room, this is a room, right? And you also have to admit, this looks engineered, doesn't it? This isn't random, because if it was, then why do we look like that? Why do chickens look like that? Why do piggies look like this? So now I want you to take those straight scissors or maybe a scalpel. I want you to open it up, open all of this up so you can trace where this muscle ends up and how does it connect to the bone? So surgeon, kindly. So what are we looking for? Now, remember that extra skin? That extra skin, if you recall your, uh, your, your muscle uh, uh, lecture or video that I made, right? It wraps around the muscle. And do you see how just, um, if this is too small to look at, use your imagination when you're, um, like I used to bring a little piece of chicken, but then, you know, that was that. Right, because then people then start association, associating piggy with food, and then that was never a good idea. Right, but we all know what chicken looks like. And do you know that extra skin that's underneath, you know, the crispy goodness of the skin when you uh, uh, um, are eating uh, fried chicken? Well, do you see how it all covers the muscle, but then it comes together into a hard, tough band that connects mm -hmm. into the bone? So, what our surgeon here is trying to do today is we're just trying to open it up and we're gonna try to trace that covering, that shiny covering to a bone and to a muscle to see if we can identify a tendon. And remember, a tendon is that fascia that's covering the uh, muscle that uh, all uh, like bands together and then connects to a muscle. I mean, the, connects the muscle to the bone, hence the term skeletal muscle. So, that's any muscle that's going to move my skeleton. So if I had any muscular problem, can I move my bones very well? Nope. If I had a bone problem, can I move around very well? Nope. If I had a tendon problem, can I move my, can I move my limb around very well? No. So that's how orthopedic surgeons and that's how uh, doctors try to figure out, like if you're limping, like let's say you, you played some soccer 
and then you twisted your ankle. That's what they're going to investigate. Of course, they're not going to cut you up like this, or they might if it's really bad. At the bottom of the right. Yeah, so we everyone feel, we all know what bone feels like. It's much harder. And then feel the muscle. Feel the muscle, feel the bone, and feel the skin. Everybody. Now, the skin is tough, but it's not as tough as the muscle. The muscle is tough, but it's not as tough as the bone. So that's, a, that's also another thing that you're doing when you're doing surgery. You use your hands uh, uh, to feel things. And we, have, we, we know that from last week when we did the heart to identify arteries versus veins, right? Uh, um, myocardium versus pericardium versus endocardium. They all felt very, very different. So now let's look at it specifically. Now, we open this up. It's hard to see. So, um, it's hard to see. It's not good. Yeah, it's a little bit juicy. So, everyone see this. Let's, let's open this up a little bit. Everyone see here how, see all the covering kind of like this part, this thing here? Mm -hmm. This is a tendon. This is part, the end part of the muscle, of the covering of the muscle. So it goes like this. There's a covering of the muscle, then it ends up here, right? And this part, right, will then attach the bone. And you could see the attachment, you could feel it, it's right here. Yeah, and just, uh, just like chicken, right? So. If now you understand that in order for the skeleton to move, it needs to be attached to skeletal muscle, also known as striated muscle. That's why if I want to move my hand, right, I have to think about it, and that moves my hand. There are tendons in here. So let's say, for example, I cut this, right? I was depressed. I cut this. Can I move my fingers? No. Actually, here are all my flexor tendons. I cut this. I won't be able to flex my hand. So if you have like carpal tunnel or something like that, the nerves are, are, are damaged here, and I do have carpal, right? Uh, but it affects my uh, radial nerve. So my thumb isn't as strong as it used to be, right? Uh, because why? Because the, there's not enough force to pull the tendon, and, and you gotta look at it like an imagination, right? Let's say there's a string connected to these. And that's your tendon. If I pull on them, what will happen to them? It'll close. But what pulls on the tendon? The muscle. And the muscle does what? Gets shorter and longer. That's all muscles do. And then the other side, if this contracts, this side has to do what? Relax. Remember my uh, lecture, the analogy, like when you get, uh, I asked the group, uh, I always ask that, like, uh, anyone here get tased? Anyone here get tased? No, I'm the only one? Okay. Right? No, I didn't get tased by the cops. Well, actually, it was the cops. Um, years ago, in the state of New York, I went to go buy um, my daughter a taser because she was going to college and she didn't want to carry a pistol. Right? Um, but a year later, she carried a pistol anyway. Right? Well, in the state of New York, you got to be tased, right, uh, before you can get the, um, you know, the permission and the license to buy a taser in the state really? of New York. Yeah. So I went to a gun show and then they were like, okay. And uh, my daughter got tased. I thought it was hilarious. And then I was laughing. And then uh, the officer there goes, uh, hey dad, you're next. I'm like, nah, man, I'm not gonna get tased. Now, what happened? When you get tased, do you move? Yeah. No, because let's say for example, this is pulling and this is pulling. What will happen? Your body will shock. No, not shock, but it can't contract, nothing can move. So if this is pulling and this is pulling, can, can I move my fingers? And that's the function of non-lethal non -lethal taser. But here's the problem. What if they're hopped up on, uh, on, on fencyclidine or cocaine? Yeah, 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 it doesn't work. I've seen, uh, remember, I, I worked as a DJ for 30 years. I've seen some crazy stuff. Uh, uh, I've seen people jump out of, uh, jump out of five-story windows and survive. And, because what, whatever kind of uh, cocktail of uh, drugs they're on, 
But in theory, like if you get tased, or let's say, for example, I'm having a seizure. Remember, seizures are uh, uncoordinated electrical impulses from your brain. Normally, it would coordinate it. This would contract, right? And this part would what? Relax. So I can open and close my hand. But if I'm having a seizure, what happens? Uh, I can't move. Yeah, so that's what happens. When you have a seizure, this pulls, this pulls. So where's it going? Nowhere. You can't move, right? And the same thing with the taser. I was thinking, I'm tough. I can handle it. You know, it'll hurt. But um, they gave me like, I don't know, 10 feet uh, and gave me like, a, like, you know, one of those rubber knives. And they were like, try to stab the officer. And I got a decent amount of knife training. I'm like, I got you, old man. <laughs> well, at the time, I was relatively young, right? Uh, I was like, I'm going to take him. I'm at least going to get close. Did I get even remotely close? No, nope, because when the guy went taser, 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 the second he said taser, my whole body went, Bleh! and you make these sounds that you can't control because how do you control your voice? How do you control your breathing? It's all through electrical impulse. And if you get tased, all the electrical impulses are what? Disorganized. So uh, my daughter has a video of it, but I, I, I made a sound like, la, 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 like that. And I, I, then my daughter couldn't stop laughing. My daughter just went, Boo! like that, and then just went down. Right? And she didn't even fight it, which was the smart thing to do. And me, I was like the whole entire time, I was fighting it. So the officer was like, zap, 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 zap. Wait, so it was the one you get closer or was it? Kind of no, it was the one where the little uh, prong things come flying out, but they, of course, they don't, they don't shoot you with that thing. They tape it to your chest or, you know, to your, your yeah, to your chest or to your arm. Uh, and then they zap you. And then you feel the full the full force of, I don't know, like something like 40,000 volts or whatever they told me how many. But all I knew was, I'm like, now as a father of a daughter who is going up to college by herself, I'm like, oh, this is beautiful, right? Um, uh, this is a, a, a nice non-lethal thing. And barely six months after that, she was like, no, nah, I want a pistol. Like, In New okay. York, she carries a gun? Oh, no, no. I she goes to, no, New York, New York, I know, I know DEA agents who are not allowed to conceal. Yeah. That's so sad. New York is so is, is so America. so very uh, strict. Oh, California is nuts. California does stuff like where you have the magazine; mm -hmm. it's stuck in the rifle. Yeah. So after and you're not you're not allowed to have more than ten rounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after I shoot my ten rounds, what am I going to do? Yeah. I'm going to stand there, right? And so, but uh, let's not me get me started. You know, <laughs> you guys know I've been a shooter since I was twelve, and I have a very very I have a very, very unpopular view of, and I, that's why I love Virginia. I have a very, because I grew up in New York and all my weapons were at the, were locked at the range for decades. And then now when I moved down here, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I concealed for years, but you know, when I really come to think about it, now that I'm getting older, not worth it. Uh, it, it it's not worth it. And it makes you, it may, it, uh, uh, and I'll get off the topic, even though I'm a, I'm a staunch Second Amendment um, person. I don't know, when I was carrying it, it, it made me want to you pick want, it up. Yeah, you want to pull it out. And because of years of not having one, years of not having one and needing one, I've been mugged four times when I went to college in New York City. Three times in New York City, one time in Newark. And I went to school in Newark, New Jersey in the 90s, which was the murder slash um, carjacking capital of the world. New York, New Jersey still has a law after 10 p.m. If something, if you see something shady, like coming around your car, you're allowed to, you're allowed to run red lights. Mm. I don't like going back to Newark, even though they, they have a lot of um, renewal there, it's still Newark, New Jersey. It's, it's, it, it's way too close to New York. It's, it's, it's the home of the past train. So you have a lot of criminals and ne'er-do-wells coming in from New York City into New Jersey. And also, it's right next to Piscataway, for heaven's sake, in Jersey City. Um, uh, I have a lot of family in Jersey City. That place is wild west. Little kids got guns, and that place makes me crazy nervous, right? So, but me personally, uh, ever since a couple of years ago, did you hear about that guy down in um, Eisenhower Connector? Never had a problem with the law. Concealed carry for decades. And uh, the person he shot, she never had a problem with the law. Both of them are clear-headed individuals, they're grandparents, but the woman got pissed off at the guy. The woman j jumped out of the car, started kicking the guy's car. 
The guy got nervous, put four in it. Now he gets to be in jail. And these are two normal people. But when, remember psychosis? Osis, abnormal condition of the mind. You guys know when you're angry, it's easy to do what? Go over to the dark side very quickly. Now, you add that and you have a weapon in your hand. I'm telling you, how many times where it was just a little altercation and my hands are ready on my weapon. And that's scary, especially when my kids were in the car. I'm like, as a parent, I want to protect my children, but I'm already now endangering my children. So even though, yeah, yeah, I got a little bunker at home, but I keep it in the, I keep it in the safe where it belongs. And I only take it out in the range when I get to train myself or my baby. And I'm now even, and even though I have concealed, I, I have concealed carry, but I, I, I have the license so I can have a decreased amount on my insurance. Right. So these are the things as healthcare professionals, we also have to know and understand. You got to look at the data. Um, there's a lot of mental health going on, right? The odds of you killing yourself or harming others, if you have a weapon in the house, get increased fourfold. That is the truth. That is not politics talking. That's the truth. So having because having a weapon, there's pros and cons, but if you don't live in that kind of neighborhood and I don't live in that kind of neighborhood anymore, that's why over the, over the last 10 years, I significantly decreased the amount of weapons I have in my life because I only need it for what? Train, you know, to train. And if ever there was a zombie apocalypse, um, I used to have 14 rifles. Oh what are you gonna do with 14 rifles? Well, what am I gonna start a war? And my wife said the same thing. Look how much money we're wasting. Instead of taking all that money and for the kids, right? I had one rifle, it was like $2,500. What am I gonna do with a $2,500 rifle? I don't even go hunting anymore. So as a medical professional, you start changing your mind on how, and also once you see what that little bullet can do to a human being, you don't wanna, um, there was a nice um, um, article in NPR a couple of months ago, the cost of being shot once. It's over $200,000 in not only surgery, hospital bills, going to the doctor, so just like prevention for heart disease, like, you know, Dr. Grice really shouldn't eat Doritos, the same thing, right? Get things out of your life or out of your patient's life that would potentially increase the chances for harm, right? And, and, and now that's a, actually a common question at the doctor's office. Do you own a handgun? Because if you have any um, history of any mental disease or depression, would that now make you at risk? You betcha. But here's the problem, this is Virginia, we're all there's a lot of military personnel. What do they all get used to? My son, before he went to the court, never picked up a gun in his life until six months prior to the court when I trained him. Now, when we're home, he has one on him all the time. And I go, hey, you're not in Afghanistan, what are you doing? He goes, that's habit. And I go, you gotta get rid of that habit when you come home, right? And it's wrong because eight months, and then they come home in two weeks. What's their mindset? Like it's, they're still there. So that's why I can't, and it's nice that COVID, I kind of sequester him for a couple of days. So I know that what, he gets used to what? Being with the normal people for a while. And it's, a, and, and it's really rough. And we, we have to watch out for our veteran population because again, high risk. So when we're looking at that, this, right? Now we know muscular, right? Sorry, I, jumped off the edge like I always do. But again, I brought it back to healthcare, didn't I, Mr. Francis? All right, so who's next? You now are the surgeon, and who wants to be uh, the assist? Now, the next thing you're gonna do is, I want you to cut here and cut here, and then be careful of a uh, little thing. I want you to try to open his jaw like a Pez dispenser. Like, boop. So cut here and cut here, right? I don't kindly uh, hold it so, uh, yep, here, here you go. So pick one side, yeah, this side, and then she can uh, then switch her hands. You can. Okay, good. And then you can lay Piggy on the side like this and then do the same. Well, you can, you can just hold Piggy right here, get the back of the leg, and do the same thing here, cut from here to here. I'm here to you. Well, Cut the different direction because if you cut like this and you slip, right? 
So you could also see how the surgeon also has to be cognizant of where the assist is, right? Where your nurses are, where everyone is, right? And you notice when she cut, did she cut like, like that? She cut with a purpose on like, uh, like centimeter by centimeter. So it's at this point in the show, right, we're gonna try to, try to open this up. Do, 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 do. I can take a straight scissor. Open all of this up. Sorry, I'm being a little bit brutal. Oh yeah, okay. Now, let's all look at the tongue. Everyone feel it? And what does it feel like? Hard. Hard. Doesn't it feel like the heart? Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's a muscle, right? And it's, um, of course, it helps us speak, right? It helps us swallow. And how do we know? Everyone feel this part. Be careful, uh, might have some teeth. Yeah, there's some teeth here, oh, little baby teeth, oh. right? But feel here. Everyone feel this, it's like a washboard and it's hard. Now, stick your finger all the way down here. Doesn't it change? Yeah. It's hard and then it gets really gummy, right? Well, that's your hard palate transitioning into your soft palate. And it makes sense. I need this heavy, heavy muscle called the tongue. <coughs> and when I eat, it's gonna have to, it's gonna have to smash the food here. And that's why when we eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, where does all the peanut butter and jelly end up? Up here in your hard palate, right? Because what is your tongue doing? Smashing the food mashing it because what are we doing when we eat? Metabolizing, meta, meta means change, bowl means growth. So I'm changing the food so that I can grow, right? Now, let's also look at the tongue. Does everyone see how, just like the lecture, well, uh, you guys haven't had that lecture yet. You'll have it in anatomy and physiology too. Do you see how the tongue has different sections? You see that there's, like, like there's, this is different looking than this. And if you look back here, this is totally different looking than this. So the tongue is separated into these different taste zones, okay? So you can see the tip is for um, uh, uh, salty and sweet. The sides is for sour. And the ones all the way back here are for bitter. And when you think about it, like uh, I wish we could do this uh, lab. We used to do this lab before pre-COVID. But now you can't because everyone's tasting, or you can't do that, right? Well, we used to have little surveys on oh, where do you taste? You know, you you uh, you put something sour on the tip of your tongue, and then the majority of the class won't be able to taste it. But if you put sour on the sides, right? And it makes sense. Like, have you ever eaten a sour ball? What happens? You start to salivate. Where's your saliv salivary glands? There, on the sides. Let's see if we can look at some glands. Yeah, I can. You know what? This is our lovely gooseneck light. We use this in clinical, especially in uh, ENT and obstetrics, because you need a concentrated light source. I really should get one of those ring things. You guys see like little bloggers and stuff use that? Ring light? Yeah. Even my kids do um, uh, Twitch and like that. And I'm your classic parent who just totally ruins everything. Walk around like, hey, you winning, son? And they're like, dad, I win my friend. And I go, I don't care. I paid for the internet, I paid for that computer. I can get to do whatever I want. Okay, see how we can see things a little bit better? I was, I was wondering, like, is it just my boomer eyeballs or I can't see spot? So now, hopefully, maybe at home you can see it a little bit better. There you go. Let's, let's see. See that here? See that? That's a hard palette. And then if you look at the tongue, right? There's different regions and it looks different. And you have the soft palate here. Now let's look for some glands. So what happened to this food? Um, 
it wasn't quite born. And you know when they slaughter pigs, you know, because we want mommy pig because it's big. But sometimes mommy pig has what? About 12 of these in, uh, inside our womb. So we take these and then you stick them in the juice and, um, and then so we all can learn. Everyone look at this thing right here. Where is me probe? <laughs> Thank you. See this little button here? See it's covered in fascia. Let me open it up a little bit. It's hard to tell, but you see this little button here and then this material here that kind of looks like a sponge. Everyone see that? Well, that is a gland. And that's one of the salivary glands. You have actually three sets. You have a couple of sets here on the side because remember the sour, right? And you have also uh, another set somewhere underneath the tongue. And you can see underneath the tongue as well, you have some teeth. This is called your frenulum. And if you really look underneath the tongue, there you go, bingo. Everyone see all of these arteries and veins? See that? Well, we have sublingual, and you can come on this side if you want to look. We have sublingual arteries and veins in there. And there's a reason why if you have to take sublingual medication, like um, uh, what's an example of uh, uh, medication that you have to put underneath your tongue? Um, Lorazepam. Lorazepam. Or Lorazepam. 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 What's the most common? You guys are like looking for zebras instead of horses. The most common is what? When you have chest pain, angina, right? What do we um, make you take? Exactly. Nitroglycerin, uh -huh. right? That little uh, white pill. But the patient's not allowed to swallow it. They have to do what? Put it underneath their tongue. Now, you saw all those arteries and veins there, right? You put it underneath your tongue, it melts. Then it goes right in and it has a very, very quick mechanism of action. Versus if I swallow it, if I swallow the pill, it has to go down and then it gets processed with the liver, right? Then it goes to the stomach and the intestines. It takes way too long for that drug to get into your body. And that's called bioavailability. You'll learn that in pharmacology. But if I just put it right underneath my tongue, you see all these arteries and veins here, it goes what? Boom. So if I have angina or chest pain, right? Maybe I got a heart problem. What do I do? I take my nitroglycerin, it goes underneath the tongue and you see all those arteries and veins that I just cut open. What'll happen? It'll go right into the blood system, get to the heart. What? Not as fast as an IV, but pretty darn fast. So uh, that's why when your patient has chest pain, they're supposed to bring their little uh, nitroglycerin wherever they go so that they start having chest pain, right? And the chest pain angina is due to, remember the coronary arteries? They're not delivering blood as well as they uh, would. And nitroglycerin has nitro, which is um, part of uh, nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is known to open up blood vessels especially the blood vessels in your coronary arteries in your heart. And that's why you take the little white pill. All right, who's gonna be surgeon next? The next part, gonna open up this. Uh, well, this part, gonna open up this part. And who's gonna be surgeon? Who, who has a, uh, who's next, right? aren't you next? So I want you to open this up and see this, feel this. This knot right here. Don't be afraid, the pig's already dead. Right? Well, it never was alive to begin with. Remember, fetal, right? Well, depending on uh, you know, people's definition of living and, and I'm not gonna touch that until you guys are in my MED 230 um, medical law and ethics class. So have uh, one, whoever's gonna be the next holder or assistant, hold this down here. And then the surgeon open all of this and you can see fascia, right? Oops, I'm blocking it. You can see all the fascia here. Open all this because this is your larynx, okay? Before we all cut it open, everyone feel it, how hard it is. Because it's what? If you recall the lecture, the larynx is a cartilage. It's not quite bone. So feel that and then feel, feel like the teeth. The teeth are super, super hard. The hard palate is super, super hard. But you feel the... The cartilage, it's hard, but there's some give to it, okay? And that makes sense because my vocal cords can't be stiff. They've gotta be strong, but not 
you know, not so stiff that they don't uh, vibrate uh, like a guitar string. So, surgeon, kindly cut this open. Uh, get, get, um, there should be two tubes. Try to cut as high as you can here and up to this level here where my finger is. Try to cut that. Right yeah, I'm going to get a webcam so I could just do that the next time. So you feel that, like that kind of knot, and there's tubes associated with it. Cut all of that out too. Because now the next part is, we want to look for the epiglottis, of course, the larynx, which is the voice box, and the two tubes associated with the larynx, which is your trachea and your esophagus. You guys, would you guys mind me taking pictures of you guys in action for the website? I'll give you guys the permission slip so you can sign it. But your, your faces won't be shown just like, you know, your hands. Like, so it looks like, ooh, you're engaging. Of course, we've got to, got to put the DJ logo on it. <laughs> no, but my, my company's done. No, there's no more DJing. This is, we are done. The music business is done and doneer. Okay. Did you cut it out? I should cut. Yeah, cut it out. Yeah, cut it out. Go. Let me get another chop so that we can uh, then analyze it. Yeah, the, whoever's next is going to be doing the thoracic cage. So, so let's look at this. Let me get a. What's the mean touching things with? I always used to use the excuse that, hey man, I was an, I was an EMT technician in the '90s. I don't have disease yet. But we had a staff member. Um, he worked in ICU for 50 years and he just recently died. In the beginning of COVID, he said the same thing. He was like, if I didn't get COVID yet, if I didn't get this, not yet. Right? Something to think about, right? Do not put ourselves in danger. So let's look at this. And all of us felt this, right? It was, right? We, well, when it was still attached, right? So the first thing we're going to look for. And of course, look at that fascia. See that fascia with all, yeah. all those. Well, if you were here, you'd see it is all arteries and veins. So the covering is not only protects us, it also provides a nice little venue for what? All arteries, veins, and nerves that, you know, did you ever wonder how all the arteries, veins, and nerves like know where to go? Yeah. Or like, you know, how, how do they all fit in? So. So I'm going to, ooh, you did a good job here. Let's just take this out. So let's look at it, and then let me clean it up. Oh, this is the larynx. Yep. Larynx, which is our voice box. And of course, here, the upper part where is our uh, pharynx, right, which is the throat. Now, remember we talked about um, glands? You guys see this? Right? These are more glands, more glandular tissue. Remember your thyroid and your parathyroid, and it's right next to what? Your, uh, your larynx, well, and it has that spongy look, right? You see? The same spongy look as those little bumps that we saw in the oral cavity when we were talking about the salivary gland. So remember I always talked about since uh, our first and second lecture, form always dictates function. So if it looks like a sponge, then it's what? It's gonna sop something up or it's gonna release something. And that's a gland. And here it's, uh, I can't tell, 
Um, it's part of your thyroid and parathyroid. So if we're looking at this, thank you for the soundtrack. Always pleasant. All right. You see here? See that little, well, where's my probe? Everyone see here that this is a, a this is a little flap. This little flap, that's your epiglottis. And if we look here, right, we have one thing that's here that's in the front, but can we see that the hole is, is big and it's open? But then if I look at this hole, it's flat. So this is anterior, this is posterior. And the anterior part, that's your trachea. And we know your trachea has C-shaped cartilaginous rings. And it makes sense. I need to breathe, yes? My trachea, my windpipe. So whoever built us, built us really smart and put the trachea on the front part to keep this tube open. Now, when I'm eating, what happens? The esophagus does what? Flaps over. So now when I'm eating, does everyone look how soft but expansive, how flexible? And of course, there's an artery, right? Uh, and we know that from last week's lab. But this big tube down here, that's got to be your what? Esophagus, your food tube. And the food tube has to be what? Flexible. It can't be rigid. And that's why, you know, when your moms or your dads or whoever took care of you told you to eat normal bites. I was one of those kids. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to, it's obvious, right? But my mom used to always say, he goes, 20 bites, 20, uh, 20 chews or something like that. It's hard to translate in my language. But I had to sit and go, one, one, two, three, four. But to this day, I totally, now that I'm an adult, I go straight to three, right? And then I swallow. So you totally but, say 20 bites is pretty small. Yeah, when I was a kid, because I was one of those kids. Like, um, 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 like I'd eat burgers, like, you know, in like four bites, right? Yeah, I, I was not a, I was not a, uh, what you would deem a normal child, right? Poltergeist, sorry, sorry to bother you, sir or madam. Yeah, you guys laugh, but man, I've been here, me and Chef Nori, and also Russ in admissions, we're the original crew. We were here when this building wasn't even built out yet. And um, it's good that I'm being recorded because just in case the poltergeist gets out of control. We've all, especially the second floor, anyone who's worked here at night or the weekend, have experienced some really, really creepy stuff. And when you guys work for a facility, you'll see there's like, there's like these little things. I don't know what you all believe in, but there are a lot of things in this world that science doesn't really answer. So there are things that happened on this campus that me and with my scientific mind cannot answer, right? But uh, the poltergeist, ever since I apologized to it, it leaves us alone, right? Um, oh yeah. Um, oh, especially my sons. My sons were always the victim of the poltergeist. And I'll tell you one ghost story while we're looking at this. So pass this around, everyone uh, look at all the parts, right? And see if you can identify which one's the esophagus, which one's the, uh, the trachea, right? Look on the bottom and you'll see one big open tube and one big flat tube. So that means when you're eating, what happens? The epiglottis folds down, so you shouldn't be breathing when you eat or drink because that should cover your trachea so that the food or the water goes down the posterior flexible tube called your esophagus, right? Uh, don't try it at home, but have you ever like, you know, you're drinking something, but you forgot to say something, but you want to say something to somebody and then you start coughing it up because you're not supposed to be talking while you are drinking or while you're eating, right? Uh, oh, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when we were on the dinner table, my, my parents are very religious. And in the Catholic, well, in many faiths, uh, uh, we, were, we were raised super, super Catholic. So, you know, eating is a blessing, right? Not everybody in the world gets to eat every day, right? So eating is a blessing. So you really shouldn't be, you know, talking while you're eating. And also you shouldn't be talking while you're eating because these two systems will start competing with each other. And that's the reason why we put the patient sometimes on mechanical ventilator because uh, when we do surgery, because one of the major side effects of, uh, of anesthesia is vomiting. So if I vomit, 
right? Don't you think, especially if I'm uh, under anesthesia, the epiglottis might not work as well. And then don't you think some of that vomit might go down into my lungs? Yeah, it might. And vomit has what? Has a lot of the nastiness that's in your stomach. It has acid. So those things aren't very good. And you could be predisposing your patient to something called um, um, aspirational pneumonia. And it's very, very hard to treat. So that's why when you tell your patient, no food, just water, or no food, no water, make sure they comply. Because how many times, uh, I'm not a surgeon, but how many times I've been surprised? How many times at the very last minute, uh, I caught my patient like eating a piece of a bagel or having some orange juice, and it, it puts them in danger. Now, remember, your patient isn't stupid. They're just laypersons. They don't know why you're telling them what to do. And, but as adults, they're like, they make up their own rules. You guys know as an adult, like, man, I don't have to wear my mask all the time. Or man, I don't have to keep both my hands on the, on the wheel, on the steering wheel. Government can't tell me what to do. You, you know how people are, right? I am the same exact way, but you have to convey to them, there's a reason why I'm saying to you what I'm saying to you. And if you have a moment, tell them the reason. I don't want you to get this thing called aspirational pneumonia. It's really, really bad. And you'll be in the hospital for months. So please, I know it's rough, but um, uh, after the surgery, I'll get you a cheeseburger. I'll get you whatever you want. But after the surgery. So but, why aren't pregnant women allowed to do this? Because if, uh, and also, if my patient ate and her stomach is, stomach is full and her intestines are full, she delivers baby, what also was going to come out the other hole? And that, um, almost a third of my pregnancy, the baby might fall into that feces when we catch, right? So that's why I'm constantly irrigating the area. And that's why if you look at uh, the stirrups, if you look at that metal table that fits underneath to catch the baby, you see it's slanted. And at the bottom, there's a drain into a bucket. Right, so that anything that comes out, feces, urine, or anything, because remember, mommy's pushing for dear life. I mean, literally, right? And sometimes stuff comes out. Oh, by the way, and even if you guys are the midwife or the assist, wear your shield. Um, because stuff also comes out of the vagina as well. And if they're pushing, it... one time I wasn't wearing my shield, right? And meconium, which is like, the, you know, the stuff that the baby is covered in, which is also, it's like the baby's, one of the baby's first poops. Mommy was pushing and I go, mom, hold, mommy, hold, mommy, hold. I was in, I was in there, in the pocket, right? I'm grabbing the baby so that the baby doesn't fall into uh, anything that would, um, that would uh, uh, in, um, be a potential infection to the baby. And, and stuff came out and I wasn't wearing, I was only wearing my mask and not my shield. You wear your mask, your shield and your, your gown. But I was in a hurry. It was an urban center. Again, I wasn't listening to the rules. And then what happened? All that stuff's on my face and my hair. And then the nurse is looking at me like, and I go, dummy, and then go, and she's holding, she's holding my shield in her hand. Like, there's a reason why we tell you to put this thing on, doctor. And I'm like, eh, sorry. Like, oh, it wasn't doctor. I was still a fourth year medical student. So she was calling me some choice words on how stupid I was. And after, that was like my fifth or sixth delivery as a medical student, and I learned real quick, wear all your stuff, because it's not only gross, but what if she was HIV positive? What if she had hepatitis? And that stuff went in my eye, went in my mouth, went in my nose, because when it hits you in the face, it'll drip down where? Right, to your mouth. So I learned a valuable lesson. When they tell you to wear your PPE, you wear it all the time. It's a pain. But it has to be done, especially in in this uh, post-COVID world. Okay, all right. So um, uh, nice little lesson. And also, w when I caught the baby, I want to scream, I want to freak out. But what do you have to do? You got to keep calm. And the priority is what? Catch that baby. And then, and then, right? Can I walk? Well, oh, mommy, can you hold on for a minute? Let me just giggle out and deal with what I got to deal with. No. So for the next 20 minutes, all that stuff is in my mouth and my face, and I had to go deal with what I got to do. And then after it was all done, I went in the bathroom. I was like, bleh, bleh. and I'm like, oh, and I was so angry at myself. And then when I went back to the nursing station, the nurse proctor, who is the person who will be grading you, she's waving that thing in my face. What did I get for the day? Zero. 
zero. <laughs> Even though I, I perfectly delivered a baby, the stitches were great, everything was great, mommy loves me, everyone loves me, but what did I get at the end of the day? Big fat goose egg, because why? Was I following the rules? No, and the rules in the hospital are there for a reason to protect me. All right, who's next? Who's the surgeon next? Come on down, come on, come on. Okay, who's next? Let's put this aside. And whoever's next, okay, and uh, if you want to be the, your job now is to, oh, looky here. You see this like webbing here? That's your pericardium. This, if this was all closed, oops, bad habit. This, if this was all closed, it covers this heart. And of course, everyone feel the heart. Oh, look, yeah, right, right. right. This is your, uh, um, uh, what? what is this? Well, of course you could see it's a patent, uh, it's an artery and it's patent, right? It's open, right? So when I start doing this, and it's uh, connected to your heart. So if you look at this, see how tough it is relatively? And this is the pericardium, it covers the heart. So you take out the heart and the lungs, and then I want you to put it here, and then we can look at it. And uh, the cyst, the cyst when you can. Now, do you see when your gloves, especially the vinyl, they start looking like this? Mm -hmm. They start getting clear. You, uh, and you can kind of feel like your, your, in, your fingers are starting to get moist. Glove out, switch out. And if you have to go through four or five sets, you have to go through four or five sets. It needs to get done. And you can see, look, my hands are cracking because I've been having labs for the last two weeks. Heart. So, if you look at the heart, can you can you identify it? Can you identify all the structures? Do you know what's front and what's back? Um, Remember last week? What's front? What's back? Which is very important for. So, what are we looking for in the front? The, if you remember, if you recall the, last week. Um, what's the thing? What's Watch the, that scalpel. Oh, sorry. The thing on the tip, what is that called? The apex. Um, the apex will be. So, there's a line the or a sulcus that's going to be going where? Across. Now, what is also in the front? Remember your atria? Yeah. So, that's how you know the front. And you see the interventricular sulcus? Mm -hmm. It's going diagonal. So that's how you know your front, and then you turn it on the back. Oh, look at this. This is a big vein. Isn't that my uh, coronary sinus? Right, you feel it. it's squishy. And then you have the posterior interventricular sulcus It's going straight down to the apex. So this is back, and this is front. Let's cut out the lungs. Oh, good, you cut them out in pieces. So cut the lungs? Is that right? No, this is the heart. That's the lung. This is a lung. And also, feel the lung. After she cuts it out, feel it. The lungs looks like the liver. Yeah, it looks like the liver, but it doesn't feel like the liver. It doesn't feel like, everyone's had liver, right? Mm -mm. I used to love liver when I was a kid, but now it just grosses me out. So good for you. Yeah, I used to have like whole liver sandwiches. Ugh. Just liver and mayonnaise. Okay, now, Professor, the, when I think about liver, it makes me ill. Yes, question. The ribs uh, just like uh, a protector to the lungs, right? Yeah, so we look at the ribs, right? Oh, that's another thing. Thank you for mentioning that. If we're looking at the ribs, well, it's hard because uh, it, you know, it's still connected. If you were here, you'd feel it. They're flexible. They're not like you know your fingers. Like everyone feel this. This is like hard, right? But when we feel the ribs here, doesn't it feel like just like uh, the same consistency as the larynx? And why do the ribs have to be flexible? To move. To move. Expand. Yeah, to expand, yeah. right? If they can't expand, I can't create a negative uh, pressure in order for me to inhale, right? If they, if they can't relax, I won't have the, uh, enough increased pressure to then we'll do what? Exhale. Well, I never even thought of it like that. Right? It has to be a negative pressure. How is it? Does anyone, uh, does anyone ever like uh, got really hurt in the front of their chest? No? Huh? When I was like 10 years old, I was playing football and I ran into um, like a barbecue and full speed. 
and it um, broke three of my ribs. Ooh. Now, if you had that much pain in your chest, how, how well are you breathing? Not very well. So I was breathing like what? <laughs> ooh, 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 it was painful. I was crying because I was, I was going for it. Yeah, I was going for it. But then everyone was yelling at me and I thought everyone was yelling at me because yay, the girl of the park. But everyone's yelling at me, you're running towards the, you know, one of those um, metal uh, barbecue things that are in the park, you know? And I ran into it and I got skewered by the two handles. And, uh, oh yeah, I was one of those kids. Um, in and out of hospitals, I have multiple surgeries, multiple fractures. I've had, how many concussions? I think three, three or four. And uh, one of them was a class two. Um, I got hit in the head in baseball twice. One by a ball and another one by a bat because I played catcher for 10 years, All right? So you can only imagine my case history. So when we look at this, right? We already know the heart, so we don't have to go through it. But since you're there, can you take the scissors and open it up so we can look at it? So let's, uh, and then we'll look at the heart. And then you, I could give you another scissors and can you cut open one of these lungs? What am I cutting? Cut the heart in half, open it up, or use a scalpel. Now, put your hand out like this, right? And then when I hand it to you, right, I'm gonna slap it. And then you close your hand, and that's when I release. Right, a little bit of uh, surgery, right? If ever you're in my MEB 220 class, we're here, we do, uh, we do piggy again, but we do, it, uh, we do surgery. So, let's look at the inside. What do you see when you open that you up? I mean, it's kind of all the way. Yeah, all the way. So when we look at it, it looks spongy because it makes sense. And there's, there's holes and there's tubing in it. Now, when you look at the end, do you feel anything hard? The end? Yeah, the end, uh, uh, um, end of the lung. No. You don't feel anything because remember, it's only at the beginning part of the lung that there's some cartilage. But near the ends, it's more um, smooth muscle. Hint, hint, beautiful question. Uh, so let's look at the heart. We all know these things what already. Part is cartilage? I'm sorry. Hmm? What part of the lung is cartilage? The, uh, if you feel here, like this part right here, right where, uh, where it had the trachea and oh, okay. the carina, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, like but, then the re but the end of it is what? Soft. Soft. So it's smooth muscle. Right? So that's why asthmatics have to take certain medications to do what with their smooth muscle? Turn it off. Because what happens when the smooth muscle gets turned on? Squeeze, wheezing, having a hard time breathing, yes? But then I take a corticosteroid or I take a, um, an alpha blocker and what will it do? Right? Now, we all know this, right? When you look here, you can see everything. It's really small, chordae tendinae, and you can see uh, the difference between uh, the atria. See the atria, how smooth it is? And you can see the atria, it's even a different color, isn't it? And here, you look at it, the trabeculae carne, and we also feel it. So all the stuff we talked about in the heart, even though it's really super small here, it's really easy to identify because we now know stuff. Like now, here's the other thing about the lung. This has how many parts? One, two, three. This one has one, two, and it has this little notch. That's how I know this is the left lung and this is the right lung. The right lung should have three lobes, an upper, middle, and lower. The left lung should only have two lobes, an upper and a lower, but the left lung should have a little space where the heart should fit because where's our heart? It's on the left side. So that's called the cardiac notch. Do they perform different yeah. functions? Yes. Question? Do they perform different functions? No, they perform the same function, but it makes sense that the left only has two lobes and a cardiac notch because what's taking up the space? The heart. On the right okay. side, there's nothing taking up space. Okay. Right? But uh, lung, uh, lung volume-wise, they're both relatively the same. But just know for the exam purposes, if I ask you, he goes, how many lobes are uh, on the lung or on the right side? You'll tell me three. How many on the left? Two. He goes, where's the cardiac notch? On the left side. 
Or I can just show you a picture and then you tell me. You tell me what's right, what's left. Remember, that's a big thing. What's right, what's left, especially the heart and the lung. Question. Are you going to say that? Yep, it's already there. Um, the practice exam is already there. Uh, and it's already in your announcement, so you can look at it uh, this afternoon, definitely. And it's an exam that I just gave, I think, uh, March of last year. And it's going to look, it won't be exactly the same, but it's going to look a lot like your final. And your final written, of course, will be the same format as in midterm. All right. So now that's the, now we didn't see the pora because just like the pericardium, uh, we cut it all out. Now, before we move down, does everyone see this thin muscle here? And you feel it, feel it. It's hard. And that's how I know it's a muscle. And that's, of course, your diaphragm. Remember the two muscle sets that are important for inhalation. I need that thin muscle, the diaphragm, and I need my intercostal muscles. And if I look here, in my rib, rib cage, you can even open this up and you could see there's arteries, veins, and nerves uh, uh, in between here, and there's muscle. And I need both the intercostal muscles and the uh, diaphragm when I'm inhaling. Now, do I need anything when I exhale? No. All I have to do is those two things have to relax and then I can exhale. But I need my diaphragm and my intercostal muscles. Does that look like a beautiful both A and B question? Hint, hint. Right? When you need that negative pressure so that you can inhale. So you have to have a pressure gradient. So if I shot Piggy in the chest, is there any more pressure gradient? No, the, the pressure on the outside will not equal the pressure on the inside. That means there's no movement, no movement of gas, no movement of gas, what happens? You die, right? And just a little side note, let's say for example, Piggy got stabbed, right? It'll have a sucking, uh, Piggy will have a sucking chest wound. So what do you do? You take saran wrap and you put it on the chest. And then I want you guys to make a tape on the top, I mean the top and the sides, but let the bottom open so that when my patient exhales, flap out, when they inhale, the flap goes in and keeps the seal. It's good enough to get to the ER, right? And um, nowadays, the, the packs that we have have seals on only three sides when we're, doing, when we're dealing with something, something like a sucking chest wound. Question. Um, so when people, I don't think this is irrelevant, when people have like, you know, like nurses, you'll see or a doctor like take a pin and stab it in their throat. Oh, yeah. What is so that? if I'm doing like, uh, let's talk about that. Sometimes, okay. let's say, let's say, and it's related to your, um, your respiratory system. Because remember, you have the upper respiratory, and then you have this, the lung, the lower respiratory. Let's say, for example, um, last time I did a, a trach, um, I had a patient who had blunt force trauma to her face. She was a truck driver and she smashed her face on the, um, the steering wheel. She, was going, she wasn't even going that fast, 40, 45 miles per hour, but here's the problem. Um, her nose was all smashed up, all her teeth now fell into here. Oh. So all this is covered, she can't breathe. I tried to take out as many teeth as I can, but now she's struggling, now she has dyspnea, we got a problem. So what do I have to do? Remember those cartilaginous rings, right? And the trachea is in the front. So I have to cut in between the cartilaginous rings. Then I, uh, that opens up a hole, right? And that's called a tracheostomy. And then I put a tube in it so that my patient now can breathe. So now there's an airway from here to my lungs and all of this is stuck up. Uh, another case that I had is I did one in the field when I was in EMS. I was a rookie. Some poor soul, he was jogging in Central Park and he ate a bee. Here's the problem. He's allergic to bees and the bee freaked out and then um, uh, bit him in the back of the throat. So there was a stinger in the back of his throat, which I found. But the problem was, since he's allergic, his pharynx, larynx, and his tongue all started swelling up. So first he can't talk to me. Then the next thing you know, he's like, <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh. So I call. I'm trying to get a tube down them and I can't. So that's an indication where you have to call the emergency room. So I call the emergency room, I'm like, hey doc, I think we're gonna need to do a tracheostomy here. And he goes, yup. And then uh, while on the phone, even though I know the procedure, um, he took me step by step.
to put a hole in the trachea, then put um, a stoma, it's called the Penrose tube, and I put the tube down and my patient was able to breathe. We were only four blocks away from the hospital, but we had no choice because uh, if you know anything about New York City midtown traffic, uh, um, um, four city blocks can easily turn into 15 minutes. And that's way too long. Remember the golden five minutes? If my patient does not have any heart or lung function, they have irreversible brain damage in five minutes, just five. So that's why people in medical have a thing about time because it's so, so precious. And especially EMS, is um, so all about uh, getting the patient stabilized, getting the patient you know, to a safe place. But um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recommend EMS. It's, uh, it's one of those jobs you don't get paid very well. It's kind of dangerous. Um, especially if you were in an urban, uh, urban area. And um, there are a million two other things you can do to get uh, clinical experience. <laughs> and, uh, but I did it because I'm stupid. <laughs> and um, my, uh, uh, one of my fraternity brothers tricked me into it uh, because I had a crazy crush on some girl who had, I was a chemist, uh, a chemistry major, but I had a crush on some actress who was, um, because I went to Fordham University where everyone's an actor, an actress, right? But oh, to me, she was like, oh, she's so beautiful. And she was pre-med and he was like, you know what, she's, she's joining EMS. And my fraternity brothers, you know fraternity brothers, they're like normal brothers, they're horrible people, right? So I joined it and the next thing I know, I went to the meeting, was she there? No. Nope. And my brother was like, you joined? Stupid, now I have a commitment, right? And then, then it's his, this is the funny part. I started falling in love with it and I went, this is cool. Mm. Even though I get paid minimum wage, I get to be in danger every day. And also as a former Marine, it was fun being in danger. Um, I, I make the joke, but it's kind of true. In the two years that I was in EMS, I got shot at more. Uh, I was in more dangerous situations than in three, uh, three combat deployments. Uh, because at least when you're in a combat deployment, you're there with 39 other dudes you have a Tasker satellite and you have a C-130 ghost gunship waiting, at, waiting on you to make sure that you're safe. EMS, who do you got? Your crew chief and your driver. End of freaking list. Um, no one else is gonna help you, no one else will save you. And it was, to be honest with you, it was fun as hell, but I do not recommend it in this day and age. I to do a DW offers a class, a six week course. Yeah, it, and it's a crash course. Yeah. It really should be 12. Yeah. But after six weeks, I did not know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But then, but then you know, in it's the course crazy. of the months, it's. I'm telling you, uh, learning phlebotomy is one thing. Learning the phlebotomy in a moving van, yeah, I know. that's an adventure. My first week, I don't think I had a single stick because I, I had to be pulled off the line and retrained, right? And I was like, oh, man, this is a lot harder than I thought. And my, my plan was, I'll stay there a year, you know, do my commitment. I stayed there two and a half years. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but again, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't. Um, I, I would have worked less in undergrad so I can learn more. So who's next? Who's going to be the surgeon? Who's next? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You're picking up the scalpel, so you're next. So the next thing you're going to do is take out this thing, and this is the liver. It's got shot up a little bit because uh, you know we cut it up a little bit. But and then once we take that out, right? And everyone see here. Feel this, that's your falciform ligament. And like I stated, there's coverings, right? Like your fascia, there's things keeping your organs where they're supposed to be, right? So again, if I do anything to this, don't you think I'm gonna have to attach this thing back in? And also, if you look at the ligament as well, there's arteries and veins in it, see? So take this out. So take out the liver and whatever is underneath it, try not to cut too much and if while you're there, stomach and uh, this little thing here, that looks like an eel, pancreas. So go, cut. So take that out, please. Yep, three things. Stomach, liver, and pancreas. Now this makes sense because the pancreas is uh, intimately associated with the stomach. The liver is intimately associated with the stomach. The liver and the pancreas are accessory organs to your gastrointestinal system but they're really important, especially the liver. The liver mm -hmm. performs five major metabolic functions, meaning to say is meta chain. And we talked about the first pass effect. 
in order for you to eat, the reason why you're eating is because I want to grab the good things and then I want to throw out the bad things or the extra things. So our liver does that. So the liver not only filters, that's one, it also does carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism, and that's why a lot of the liver is very fatty. And also, since it's fatty, what was the function of mm, lipid sure tissue or uh, lipid? What's the function of fat? Other than tasting really good. Support. Yeah, it could be done for support, padding, right? But what's the main reason that we talked about in week two? Why, do, why does the uh, 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 lipocyte or the fat cell, why is it big and round and has a big space in the middle? What's the main function of lipid? Oh, Newark. That's one of my brothers. I'm sure that's right. My brothers are all lawyers. And uh, every four or five weeks, uh, Fordham University, our alma mater, always pitches to all of us for money. And one of my one of my one of my fraternity brothers is uh, on the on the committee for fundraising. Man. I remember for years when I didn't pay my bill, Fordham doesn't want to know me. Now, I got an MD in my name. They think, uh, think I got money. You're covering up a pig here, man. Okay, so you said the okay. liver and the stomach. So let's look at this liver. And again, it's in lobes, just like the lung. And we open it up and we all feel the consistency, right? It's weird. It's like spongy. So everyone. Pass it around and look at that. What did you say? I'm sorry, did you say the reason for the fat? Fat is storage of glucose, okay. right? And where do you think we get glucose from when we need it? We got it from the liver. So if my liver isn't working or is messed up, right? And see how soft it's supposed to be? Now, remember, have we all heard about cirrhosis or hardening of the liver? Well, guess what fat turns into when it gets out of hand? Fat turns into like stone, right? And that's also where you get stones. You get salt and fat together. So the hardening of that liver, now I won't be able to filter any poison. I won't be able to metabolize my cheeseburger, which is carbohydrate, fat, right? And, um, and proteins, right? I won't be able to um, uh, process any drugs, right? So liver disease is serious, serious stuff. Now let's jump to the pancreas. What happened to the pancreas? What happened to the pancreas? <laughs> Didn't you take out the pancreas? <laughs> oh man, maybe the poultry goose took it. Where'd it go? Right. Oh, here. No, this is a piece of the. This is, well, this is a piece of it. What'd you do with it? I didn't do anything. I know you were hungry. <laughs> You might have been hungry. She ate it. Uh, I'm, I'm hungry. Well, let's look at this. Here's a piece of it. And it's like a, it looks like an eel. But if you look at it, doesn't it look like glandular tissue, just like the other glands that we looked at? It looks like a sponge. And we feel it. It's very spongy. And it's because the pancreas is a major metabolic gland. And what are the two major things that the pancreas does is, it releases insulin and it releases glucagon. Now, when you eat a full meal, the pancreas releases insulin. And how do you know you got a full meal? It's right there next to its stomach. Makes sense, right? So the pancreas then releases insulin. What does insulin do for us? It uses it like a key to open up the doors on a cell so that the glucose then can go in. That's why if you have diabetes, right? The insulin or the insulin receptor doesn't work. So what happens? You've got glucose floating all over the place. And remember my analogy, where does the fuel need to be? It needs to be inside the cell to do work. Just like the fuel for your car. Do you think it's okay for me to pour fuel on your seats? No, but the fuel needs to be where? Inside the gas tank. And that's what insulin does for us. Now, what does glucagon do, do for us? Well, Anywhere from like 10 to around 14 hours um, is around starvation state. 
But prior to that, you get hungry, right? Because, you know, when's the last time uh, most of us uh, uh, ate breakfast? Most of us probably skipped, right? So it, it's been 12 hours plus. Don't do that because uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. Now, what does glucagon do? Glucagon then signals the liver, hey, we've got to break down some of that fat we've been storing because I need what's inside the fat. I need that glucose. Now, here is the bad thing about starving yourself. You're like, oh, that sounds like a novel idea, Dr. Rise. Maybe if I just starve myself, all my fat cells will be what? All burnt out because that will use up all the fat and then I'll be thin as a rail. Wrong, all right? That's what Atkins thought, right? That loony Atkins in what, 94, uh, 93, right? When, as a chemist, when I read that, when I read his book, I'm like, man, someone should take away this dude's MD because greater than what all of us know since the 20s, greater than 14 hours, glucagon no longer signals the liver to make, uh, to break down fat to make glucose. Since now you're in a starvation state, it's an emergency state. So it tells the, uh, the liver to break down fat into something called ketones. And you've already heard me talk about ketones, right? or being in a ketotic state or a starvation state, what happens? Ketones are a cheap form of glucose. The problem is ketones are neurotoxic. That's why when you starve yourself, you get irritable, you get confused, maybe you wanna vomit, you get dizzy, right? Uh, if anyone here, like maybe you got sick and didn't eat for a while, I can tell you right now, we were on Dinalax once, um, we didn't eat for three days because we got lost. To this day, I remember that lieutenant's name. I want to get that dude. Almost got us all killed. Because he forgot to pack an extra set of batteries. So we didn't make our extraction. So if you don't make your extraction, you get to walk home. Now, we got helicoptered in. So you can only imagine how far away from home we were. We were about a good four days. Right? It was like three and a half. And all of us, no one packed. I had... I only had like half a bag of Doritos and, and that went away day one, right? I was eating half that stuff on the, on the helicopter ride in, right? Well, what happened after a day or two? All of us were irritable, right? And goofy. What happened by day two, day three? Um, I got into a knife fight apparently for a Snickers uh, wrapper. Um, a fellow Marine found a Snickers wrapper in my pack and then he claimed that I was hoarding food. Because day one, when we knew we were all in trouble, we all got our food together so we can ration, right? To be smart, right? And he claimed that I was hoarding food and I got insulted. Now, oh, by the way, I don't remember any of this. This was a story told to me by other people. And I'm like, was it a real fight? And he goes, yeah, both of you had your knives out. And he goes, so we were willing to kill each other over an accusation. And you, they were like, yeah, we were all watching. And I go, mm -hmm because um, when we got to the hospital, I kind of like passed out and then they had me on um, IV. And then we woke up and I even confronted the Marine. And he was like, I don't even know who you are, sir. And I'm like, apparently we tried to kill each other a day or two ago. Because what happens? The ketones start building up. You get very neurotoxic. So you are not you when you're starving, right? Just like the commercial, right? So what do we get to our patients? Eat regularly, right? Don't miss don't miss or skip meals, especially we as medical professionals. There's, there's going to be times you're going to be so busy, you're going to forget to pee. I am not exaggerating. How many times, like, why does my stomach hurt? Ow. I'm like, oh, well, maybe because I haven't peed since yesterday. I'm, you're that busy, right? And everything is that important. And many times, you know, I'm already loopy, and the nurse would go, Doctor, when's the last time you ate? And I'm like, Sunday night, and they go, do you know it's Tuesday morning? And I go, yes, unfortunately, right? You're there that long, that hard, and the same thing with nursing staff, right? So eat regularly, get a little, take a couple of minutes to get a bite, because why? You need to have your sugar up so you can think. If you can't think, you're gonna to start to make mistakes, right? And, uh, and so, um, and also same thing with your patient. Can they heal up if they're in a ketotic state? No. You're already sick and already mentally unstable, right? So if you don't eat, no matter how 
So if, even if you're really in pain and, and uh, your patient's really in pain, you've got to promote them to eat regularly because we all need that fuel, right? And remember, cutoff is anywhere from 10 to 14 hours. And that's a long time uh, uh, without any food. You really shouldn't do that. So we have that, we have that, we, we looked at the pancreas, now we know what the pancreas does, now we know that ketones are bad. Oh, here, here's some of the pancreas, oh, it's still there, it was hidden, right? And here's more of the pancreas. See, and it looks like an eel, there's like a head and there's a tail, and you can see how it's intimately connected, and you could look here, yet another covering, right? Fascia, and look, it's full of arteries and veins. So it not only holds my organs in place, what will it do? Now, when I cut this thing open, this is my stomach. It's full of acid. Well, when the, when the piggy was alive. But everyone feel this. Feels like the same stuff that was inside here, wasn't it? Feels like just That's like not, with, with the brown stuff. Hmm? With the brown stuff. Uh, it's probably uh, whatever the mom was eating. The green stuff. It's probably like the, debris. The, the dark green stuff. Of the logs and whatnot. Oh. Uh, remember, this is a fetal pig. It didn't eat anything there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's like debris and uh, uh, cellular parts. Now, I'm gonna. I washed out, and you could see how this is tough, right? And how it's uh, a sack. That's all the muscle is, is a sac of muscular layer. I mean, that's all that the, the stomach is, is a sac of muscular layers. So when I open it up, doesn't it look like a, see all the folds? Those are called rugae. Doesn't it look like a deflated balloon? And that's why when they say, keep on your diet, the first couple of weeks are crucial because that's when you ever hear somebody say, that's when your stomach shrinks. It doesn't shrink, but it doesn't expand as much as it should, right? Because if you're used to eating a lot, what happens? Your body will get used to that. Now, remember I mentioned there's pH 2, pH 1 acid in here that could easily burn everything around you. But you could see there's mucus protecting you and there's doors. Now, you see this? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that look like an anus? Right? It does. And that's all mm -hmm. that an anus is, is a sphincter. And what's a sphincter? It's a circular muscle. So you have these sphincters here, which are circular muscles that when they tighten up, it keeps all the acid here. But let's say you had a really bad street taco. What happens? The acid will what? Reflux. And if you keep on eating really bad things or or stuff that's too spicy for you, or a lot of salt and a lot of alcohol, you'll get GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And you have a lot of heartburn, and you wake up in the morning, and um, it's um, it, uh, uh, no matter how much you brush your teeth, you have a very, very bitter taste in your mouth, because that's all the acid that's kicking up. Now, what do we have to do? Remember what I told you? What kicks up the acid? If I eat a lot of salt, if I eat too much fat, if I eat, if there's too much bacteria in the food, like I keep on eating street food, right? You do all of these things, what happens? Your body will respond to it and will respond to it with more acid. More acid then might kick up and you can see the sphincter, how the sphincter could give away. This is very, very particular in alcoholics because alcoholics, do they eat a lot? No, all they do is drink all day. And what does, uh, and, um, uh, alcohol is not good for your stomach. It's going to kick up all your acid. It's going to increase all your acid. So you can see if you know and understand how normal works, right? You have your mucosal layer. You have the rugae. You also have sphincters that control what goes in, what goes out, right? Let's now look at who's next to cut. And let's talk about the last thing, and we can call it a day. Who's next? All right. Take the, all this tubing out. You have small and large intestine, and then we're gonna open it up and we're gonna look at the difference. But right off the bat, I know I probably only put up a video for my gastrointestinal. Right off the bat, what's the difference between the small and large intestine? What do we know? Mm. 
And Mr. Francis, you can chime in if you want. What, what, what's the difference between small and large? Um, why, did, uh, why did the space aliens give a small and large? Now, we've been uh, talking about how we're breaking down food, but we haven't been talking about how we take in what we want and how we create feces. And that's the small and large intestine. Okay, so oops. we can see which one's the small intestine. It's smaller, but there's more of it. And you see how it's all curled around? And if you look here, there's all a bunch of arteries and veins. Everyone see that? See all the pink? Mm -hmm. Ton of it. Now, that makes sense because the small intestines, their function is absorption of nutrients. So I eat a good meal. I want that protein. I want that glucose, right? I want those, some of those carbohydrates. That's where I'm going to uh, absorb it. And it makes sense. Look, I got a lot of surface area and it fits in a very small package. Now, which one looks more like poops or feces? The small intestine or the large intestine? The large. And you can see the large intestine, right? It already has feces in it. See? Now, you can see the large intestine, its function, since it's larger, is twofold. One, formation and shape of the feces. And you can see these little indentations here. It's called haustra. That's why feces looks like feces. Right? It looks like little, I don't know, for lack of a better term, like little sausages, right? And that's called haustra. And that's how you can tell the difference between this and uh, the uh, small intestine and the large intestine. So small intestine, I want you to think what? Absorption of nutrients. Large intestine, two things, both A and B answer. One, formation of your feces. Two, it, uh, um, it takes in water. Now, remember I mentioned the bad street taco? How well does fat and water mix? They don't. They don't. So if this is all covered in fat, because I like having really bad street food, right? It's got all, it's greasy and it's fat, right? Will anything get absorbed? No. no. And then what will end up in the toilet? Diarrhea. diarrhea. If you recall the term diarrhea in medical terminology, dia means complete or thorough, rhea means uh, bursting forth complete or thorough. That means everything that I ate will now end up where? In the toilet. So am I getting any nutrients? No. And am I getting any water? No. Don't you think that's a really dangerous situation for a baby or an elderly patient? So diarrhea is deadly for infants and it's deadly for, um, for our geriatric patients. So in, to, to us, everybody in the middle, eh, it's just inconvenient. I go to the you know, I go, I go to the bathroom more than I not, and it's annoying. But when you think about it, if no nutrients are getting into the small intestine, no water is getting into the large intestine, doesn't that make sense why the diarrhea is so watery? Because there's water, right? And doesn't it also make sense? Like, think about the last time you had a really bad bout of diarrhea. Weren't you weak and dizzy? Yeah. And guess what? You're going to have, you'd be in a ketotic state because if you've had diarrhea for more than 12 hours, is any food getting in? No, and that's why you have to increase your fibrous intake with fruits and little sips of fruit juices to do what? Because juice has what? Glucose. Which by the way, side note, if your patient's diabetic, don't let them drink juice all day. They gotta drink water. Because, because even especially orange juice. Orange juice can kick up your uh, blood, blood sugar level a good 20, 30%, easy. Right. Oh, but okay. if they're diarrhea and I need, I need a quick boost, yeah, you, uh, you water down the fruit juice and that's uh, beneficial to, the, uh, to your dehydration patient. Question? Orange juice and diarrhea. Well, this is what I view um, nutrition. You can easily say rice is bad for you, meat is bad for you, everything's bad for you in excess, right? But um, like my kids, um, all of them water down their fruit juice, right? To the point where I can't even taste the juice anymore. I'm like, what is this? It's pink water. I got really upset because I, I wanted some cranberry juice. So my daughter did what she's been trained to do her whole entire life. She put half a glass of water, then 
half a glass of cranberry juice and they gave it to me and I tasted it because I grew up in a world where sugar, 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 right? I was like, oh, like what happened? What, this had ice in it and then melted? And I'm like, this tastes like crap, right? And my daughter tasted it and she goes, why, it's fine. <laughs> and why? Because they're trained and that's why my children most likely those will, will either get diabetes much later in their life or not at all, right? And that's why me and my mother, uh, we're the only ones in our family who are still pre-diabetic after years. I've been pre-diabetic since um, uh, 2017. I plan to be pre-diabetic until the day I die. Because once you cross over to diabetic, there's no turning back. And once you're diabetic, that means what? You have way too much sugar floating around. And remember what I said about sugar? It's like fuel being poured on your seat. So if I have a whole bunch of glucose in my eye, is that a good thing? No, it's gonna scrape my cornea. I'm gonna have vision problems. That big six carbon sugar is now gonna rest on my retina and my optic nerve. And in five years of uncontrolled diabetes, I'm gonna start becoming legally blind, right? So I can do this with every system regarding glucose. That's why I'm on a crusade, especially, I'm a member of the National Kidney Foundation and um, I'm also on the um, uh, local committee here for uh, the um, uh, uh, Juvenile Diabetes Commission. There's way too many kids here with type 2 diabetes. And the youngest one that I saw case-wise is nine. Oh my God. Yeah. When I was in medical school, that was just a case in a book. I, to be, with all the patients that I've seen and all, and I work in urban healthcare centers where we see hundreds of, hundreds of patients a day. I never saw a type two um, adolescent diabetic patient. Now, um, if I'm waiting in my um, if I'm waiting in my pediatrics office, there's at least one of them in there, and you could hear you could see them, right? They, and they don't have to be obese. Um, my nephew is as thin as a rail, and uh, he's only 12, and um, but he's non-active. All he does is play Xbox all day, and he sits there and he eats whatever he wants because. Uh, him and my cousin, they're, 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 they're very, um, they just have that the genetics, like they're, they're just thin. But if you look at his blood pressure, it's god awful. Mm -hmm. And then he, um, he gets these little um, um, hyper and hypoglycemic little seizures every once in a while because his diet is not controlled. And it's really hard because the parents work, right? You're not going to watch the kid all the time. The kid's going to eat whatever the kid's going to eat. Especially grandma is going to let him eat whatever he wants. And every time I see him, I'm like, and with Goliath's genetics, I'm like, you're setting yourself up for kidney failure, you're setting yourself up for heart failure, you're setting yourself up for a stroke. And, um, and her mother, when we were kids, was thin as a rail. Now, she's, you know, she's getting older, but um, she too is diabetic. The husband too is diabetic, right? Wow. The, little, the little sister who's nine, she's on her way, right? And why? He goes, he goes, he goes who taught the kid how to eat? parents, right? Especially if the parents are working, right? So don't you think that could set up a health issue? Because everyone now has to work super hours. Um, this is the one thing when we all moved to America in 1972, right? Land of plenty. Yeah, it is a land of plenty, land of opportunity. But you better work your butt off for it. That's the one thing people in my home country don't get. They don't get you work seven days a week and you have, and on top of your normal job, you got a side hustle. You want, you want the house, you want the car, you want all the things, or you want that career? It costs, everything costs. And um, on my, like I shared with you guys, my daughter found out the hard way. She, she was like, I'm working six days a week, sometimes seven, and I don't get my back pay. And I go, welcome to America. Uh, my daughter, uh, she's what, 22, 23. She came here to this country when she was 15. So, uh, you know, she's relatively new to the American way of living. But man, learned really fast that you want, and especially healthcare. How stressful is our day? All day, every day. It's just, it's, it's, it's just really hard, right? So what happens to our diet? What happens to our balance, work-life balance? It's very, very difficult to maintain, especially you got kids, you got family, you got a mortgage, car payments, all on top of that, right? And that's why sometimes I question, maybe not a good idea to move here. Maybe we should have stayed farmers. But then you think about it, then I wouldn't know any of this. Then I wouldn't been able to do all the cool things. So there's a balance. 
right? So, sir, that's Professor. it for today. We went through all the systems and I have you recorded. So if there's, uh, Mr. Francis, if there's no questions, you can log off. Question. Yes, shoot. Which of the intestine is directly connected to the anus? That's the large intestine. The large also intestine. Known as the colon, because it makes sense, right? If the large intestine is creating feces, right, the end product or the waste product, that that's the one that connects to the final sphincter, which is your anus. And that's all your anus is. It's just a circular muscle that looks like that. Yeah. All right? Okay. All right, sir. Next week, the exam is online. So no one come here. Even though I'll be physically here, I will be mentally, no, who am I kidding? No, I'll be here. I'll be fine. Okay. Do we have, do we have assignment this week? Yes, we have, you still have assignments. And uh, you know what, gang? Uh, on me, don't do lessons. Study. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put it in the announcements as well. And I'm also going to have, um, uh, I'm also gonna do a review video and you guys can look at that later on today. Okay. And uh, the passions exam is already on there. So you can look at it. Thank you so much. All right, so the exam is next week. I'll see you when I see you, sir. Have a good day. You too.